on the neuroscience of unconscious productivity and fulfillment. Today he will be talking about the three C's, confidence, clarity, and connection. Since graduating from UWSP, Matthew has helped high-achieving entrepreneurs wanting to get more out of their lives. He does this through his proven six-step system that helps them balance fulfillment and productivity so that they can have everything they want in their bodies, businesses, and relationships. He lives in sunny Southern California, taking long walks on the beach <laughs> with his beautiful wife, Amanda, <laughs> and his dog, Sophie. Please give Matthew a warm welcome. So, um, can I take off my shoes, guys? Are we, like, at that place now where I can, like... Yeah. Uh, I just want to, like, now. Yeah, thank you. I just want to feel really grounded with y'all today. Cool. Everyone's like, I'm going to take my shoes off, too. So if I'm going start smelling, we'll know why. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys, so I actually want to start. We just did that awesome. That was so good, Uptown Funk. I love that. Can we... Um, I want to take you guys through some grounding exercises that actually my mentor Siobhan Moran taught me, and they're uh, they're neuroscience based. So they're going to seem really silly. You're going to be like, "Why are we doing these?" And I'll explain in a moment. So take your right palm, take it to the back of your brainstem. So there's a little bump right here. That's going to be the top of your, basically the back edge of your skull. Start to cup the back of your neck, and take the index and middle finger of your left hand and place that right underneath your nose. Close your eyes and just take some deep breaths. So while we're doing this, I'm gonna explain it. In a moment, you'll kind of feel yourself clunk into your body, or really connect into your body. And the reason we're holding the back of our brain stem, and you can do this with babies as well, is it soothes them. It actually teaches them you're safe. It's okay to be here right now. You can release that. If any of you were like trying really hard, don't worry. It's like just a really simple thing. And then this one is taking your, uh, again, left hand, so I'll mirror you. So left hand, thumb to your earlobe and clasp the back of it like an earring. Same with the opposite. And what you're doing here is crossing the hemispheres of the brain. So it's called bilateral. And you're using the whole brain here. And again, just take a couple deep breaths. You know, what you're doing is you're grounding back into your body. Which as health and wellness practitioners, it's the most important thing that we're grounded, right, as we're teaching our clients to be more grounded, more embodied, more in their bodies. So you can release that one. And then very last one, same concept, but now it's whole body. So take your right wrist, place it over your left wrist, and left ankle over your right ankle. Same exact idea. You're just crossing the hemispheres of the brain here. Bilateral movement. Awesome. You can release that. So, a little different? Do we feel like a little bit more calm? A little bit more relaxed? It does a similar thing to meditation, right? So, meditation is awesome. Obviously, I recommend it to all of you. I teach it, I practice it myself. But I think even just simply doing this twice a day tremendous in being able to actually be present. Like, I feel like we're actually all here in the room right now, which is what I would really desire for you guys today, is to really be here with me during this experience. So today is called Confidence, Clarity, and Connection. So I remember it was about probably two or three years ago that I was uh, waking up to my soon-to-be wife, Amanda, and I rolled over to her and I just started bawling in her chest. And um, and I don't, it was, it was the weirdest experience because I didn't know why I was crying. And the reason I didn't know why I was crying was because my brain chemistry <coughs> was beginning to shift back to normal because I was addicted to Adderall. For a very, very long time. For those of you that don't know Adderall, I think we're all in college, we've probably all heard of Adderall. It's a stimulant. It's an amphetamine to produce more of the chemical dopamine, which is the, which is the reward chemical in the brain, right? And that is our ability to focus on something. It's the, it's the part of the brain that Facebook is really good at nailing on. Those red 
notifications like, oh my gosh, what did somebody say? What? And it's the reward that we give when we see that Sally comments, Sa oh, does anyone, there's no one's name Sally anymore. Uh, like Jill commented on my photo, right? So that's the thing that they're hitting on and that I was deficient in because I had a chemical compound helping me do that for so long. So I'm gonna get into that a little bit more in my story, but what was happening to my brain in that moment with Amanda and for a 90 day withdrawal period is that my brain didn't have enough dopamine and so I was literally in tears at really random moments. We'd be in a coffee shop and I would just start crying because my body was used to this level of dopamine that I didn't have. So I wanna start out with my story. <laughs> so this is all Matthew, you know, so I pop my collar, I was a real gangster, you know, and, uh, and I grew up with so much energy. I was such a ball of, I mean, you guys, silly to even say that at this point, you guys know I have a lot of energy, I'm very passionate, I go 200%, that's what my mom always says. So, um, and I have a sister with serious mental illness. So I grew up with a sister, um, and as an, impression, as an impressionable young bro, she was four years older than me, I super looked up to her, I was like, man, Stephanie's got all the answers. She's got it figured out, right? She's the older sis. And because her nervous system was so out of whack from, and what wasn't diagnosed until she was probably in her 20s, it was so out of whack, though, that I began to take that on. It became kind of a transmission I guess you could say of sorts. And so Stephanie uh, would have me do plays with her. She would, and my parents probably remember this, she wrote plays and we were performing <coughs> them. And what was so fascinating, she'd put me in tutus and stuff like that, like which is like, it's funny now, but looking back at it, it's like that was actually really traumatic to my nervous system. And one of the plays ended, and I still to this day, I don't know why, um, one of the plays ended where I was on the mantle of our fireplace with my arms out, and I was being crucified. Um, I, still, I still have no idea why. Um, but what happened was I froze. And there's, uh, there's something in the nervous system. You guys, I'm sure you guys have started to learn this in human physiology and exercise physiology. There's, there's the fight, flight, and freeze response. And when we're under traumatic situations, our body sometimes will just completely freeze. And that's what I did most of my childhood. And what ends up happening is that energy gets held in the body, gets stored as trauma. Um, and there's all the yoga words I could use. There's, it's called samskaras. They're held traumas in the body. And that's why we do the yoga practice, is to actually extract and remove and flow through and open up the body to greater and greater um, harmony with, with nature and with ourselves. So. I decided as a little kid that there was no room for me because Stephanie needed lots of attention. And again, I still, I love my sister so much. I want, I, I hope that that's not, that it's like, Matt's a, a jerk and doesn't really like his sister. I love my sister so much. Um, but I just decided probably five or six years old that there wasn't enough room for Matthew, for my emotions, for my feelings. And it's so funny, I was such a caretaker from a, such a young age that I decided that my parents couldn't even take care of um, my emotional needs because Stephanie was already enough. And I don't know if any of you guys can relate to this in different ways, but I felt like, you know what, they've got plenty to deal with with Stephanie. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna bow out and just allow for Stephanie to really be the one that gets taken care of. So I became the Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> Um, and, and I felt like Matthew just needs to, I'm just, I'm feeling like Matt needs to be super mellow. Not much really bothers me. You know, and I think that this is a pretty pervasive thing in uh, Wisconsin culture, and even in Midwestern culture, it's like, everything's fine. You know, especially being a guy, it's like, everything's fine. You know, I don't really have any emotions, it's cool. Uh, and I stopped asking for things. But what's interesting is instead, my nervous system needed to express this energy, this, all this energy that I had. So the way that I did it is that I'm, I'm lazy, I'm messy, I'm unorganized. Those were the things that were playing through my mind, right? We always talk about positive talk, right? And health promotion wellness and how are we speaking to ourselves? And I was telling myself all those things. So how do you think I acted in the world? I was really messy. I made a lot of mistakes. I uh, had a lot of failures. And that's why I'm an entrepreneur now because I just, I've, I get a high off 
of actually making mistakes and then learning from them and then being able to apply the new knowledge, which hopefully you guys learn to make failures and rise above them as well. So, or this isn't going to be depressing all the time, I promise. So, so then, uh, I'm going to go there, guys. So, porn and sugar became my go-to. Those were my things as a little kid. It was like, oh, yeah, this is how I can feel something, right? Like, I'll be able to feel something if I if I masturbate and if I eat tons and tons of sugar, I feel connected to something, right? That was, that was what I was really hoping, and it didn't work. It didn't work. In school, and I, I started doing everything to try to get attention, to get my voice heard. Guys, I majored in musical theater. How funny is that? Like, I didn't even consciously realize it at the time, but I just wanted to be seen. I wanted somebody to hear me. I wanted somebody to really, like, get me, you know, to really understand me. But mind you, I stopped asking for it long ago. Long ago, I bowed out emotionally. I stopped actually trying to get my voice heard, but I did it in all of these unconscious ways because my nervous system needed to express anyways. So I bowed out of sharing my heart with my family. And again, I believed I was fat, messy, and organized. All these things. And so what happened was eventually, I began to not read very well. I wasn't dyslexic, but I was told, maybe you have ADD. Enter. Uh, I felt like my speed wasn't good enough. I felt like I had to be faster. I felt like I had to be stronger. And I think in the marketplace, you guys are going to hear this. You know, I could even start to pace right now. But you need to be faster. You need to be better. You need to be stronger. You need to be all these, right? All these things that were shown in movies were shown in magazines that you need to be the six pack. You need to have all the, th you need to have your together by the time you get out of school, right? And... Adderall was my way to do it. That's what I thought was going to be the way to do it. And so, with Adderall, I was a god. Like, I really, like, I remember I'd go to some classes and I literally felt like I was a god. I was like, I mean, not like, I was, it wasn't uh, hyper hyperbolic thinking. I wasn't, like, actually thinking, but I felt like I can take on the world right now. And I became addicted. So, I'm going to leave you hanging on that. Uh, we're going <laughs> to come back to my story in a little bit. But I want to actually have you guys break off for a moment, and I want to know where do you get your best ideas? So partner up with a partner and ask each other, where do you get your best ideas? Where do you get your best ideas? 30 seconds. <laughs> have shower? Yeah, my dad had a shower, nice. No, yeah. Anyone else have shower? Or you guys all like, that's just weird. They literally make, this is so funny, they now make whiteboards that you can pop into your shower for people that get ideas when they're in the shower. Super fun. And where else? Where else do we get our best ideas? Um, we were saying kind of two different things. So when we bounce ideas off of other people, we usually get a better idea. Yeah. And then also, basically, any time we have an extended period to think, so like driving or when we're like just by ourselves or whatever. Yeah. 
That's really good. Cool. Where else? This is awesome, guys. Yeah. Um, I kind of get ideas like at random times, but I just thought of this. Um, I play the piano, and sometimes when I like play the piano, I'm not really like focused on the music. Like I'm just more like thinking, and yeah. my fingers just kind of like, do whatever. So cool. So I don't know. How Procedural it's memory. Like yeah. your brain has just got <laughs> it figured out now. So you so it can kind of start to whirl on some yeah. other ideas. Cool. Cool. Where else? Both set on the golf course. On the golf course. <laughs> yeah. 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 Pretty chilled out. Yeah, between shots, yeah. Just letting things kind of roll through. Yeah, where else? Probably like one or two more. Come on, guys, I know we got more. We were talking about how sometimes we get our best ideas from seeing other people's ideas, so mm. whether it's scrolling social media or yeah. Pinterest or reading blogs, that sometimes our best ideas come from reading about other people's ideas. That's so good. I love that, yeah. Any other last ones? Otherwise, I can add it. <coughs> Donna Cook. Dog walks. Dog walks. <laughs> the, little, the little girl, yeah. So, um, from like coming back from like being motivated or learning something. So I was in a class that I might have learned something that really motivated me. I was probably gonna be more inclined to go back and think and really yeah. want to come up with those ideas. Love that. Um, that you, and, you and me both on that one. I like that. Cool. What about George? Exercise. Exercise. Did anyone say exercise? I think we had a couple that were like kind of like yeah, exercise. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, we got another one back there. So I'm gonna go into it in a little bit. Guys, for me, it was when I was on the yoga mat. When I was practicing yoga asana, when I was moving my body, I started to notice, it's like I was like getting hit with these lightning bolts while I was exercising, while I was doing something where I was moving my body, where I was moving my body. So I started to look into the neuroscience of this, and we'll get into it in a little bit. But one of the things that I absolutely love that this crazy awesome dude came up with you can't solve a problem from the same level of consciousness from which it was created. So did anybody say, and I guess you guys are, we're not necessarily in the workforce yet, but did any of you say, sitting at my desk in my dorm? Somebody said that, okay, great. Well, maybe, and, and maybe there's something about that that's super relaxing for you that you feel like, okay, cool, I'm chill, I can do this. Anybody else find that when they're like sitting down to work, that they get their best ideas? You do, okay, cool, awesome, yeah, absolutely. And some people, yeah, some folks do that. I don't, I don't get my best ideas when I'm, when I'm sitting down to work, and most of us don't because there's some cool neuroscience at play that we will get into here in a moment. So, another cliffhanger, we'll close all these loops. 2018, maximize your human. So, guys, in 2018, we're all told, and we still talked about this a little bit earlier, we're told to strive for higher performance, right? You need to be the best at what you do, and you need to be better than everybody else. Otherwise, uh, might as well just not even try, which I think is what actually happens to a lot of us, is that we stop actually trying, or we get paralysis by analysis because it's like, oh, hopefully somebody else has the answer because my answer's probably not good enough because there's somebody else who probably knows it better than I do, right? And so again, think faster, be smarter, you're not enough. That <coughs> talk is unending, especially in the Midwest. Uh, and the way that I, that I saw it growing up, and now being in California, I have this, it just, it's so interesting, the perspective is just so different there. Sometimes it's almost that people have, I don't wanna say too much confidence, but that some people tend to be on the other end of the spectrum where they feel like they're too much, which for a lot of us might even be like, huh? And maybe some of us actually feel that way, where it's like, I'm actually too much, like people can't handle me. Like I'm actually too big. And, and then, same thing though, it's just the flip side of the coin, we end up not performing because we're kind of afraid that we're not gonna be fully accepted in that. So, at this point, it's not about being faster, especially in the, again, when you guys are getting out into the marketplace. Because here's the thing guys, we have wicked great morning routines, like, I know every single class that you've taken, somebody's been like, wake up, meditate, to take the yoga class, journal, all those things. And I teach that to all my clients. I think it's all really beneficial. But we all have that. Like, we all have some degree of that, especially if you're performing at the highest level. We already have that, right? And to be at peak performance. So at what point do we max out our productivity? And that's part of the work that I do with my clients is we talk about productivity. I was telling you, uh, my client, for anonymity, I'll call him Bill, went through my course, is now working half the time, and has 4X'd his productivity. 
But what's interesting is it's not because he's working faster. He's just working smarter. And so we're going to talk about that in a moment. But the point here, though, is that productivity has a cap at a certain point. So we lead, because we lead really full lives, guys. We lead really full schedules. We have teams that we're running. We have projects. But in a lot of ways, a lot of us lead empty lives. And a lot of the clients that I work with are really successful, but lead really empty lives. And so this can cause depression, overwhelm, anxiety, just trying to hold it all together, which this is literally just hitting me in this moment, actually. That was, I think, my sister's experience. She had it all. She got all the straight A's. And it, it was too overwhelming. So this is, has anyone seen the movie Limitless? Yeah, I know all the dudes probably have. Anyone else? Yeah? Yes, cool. OK, so Limitless is a movie. It's a fictional movie that's kind of based on reality. Like, basically, this guy gets this pill. Um, Bradley Cooper, right? Yeah, Bradley Cooper. He gets a pill. That makes him limitless. It's called NZT. And without NZT, he becomes worthless. Like, he actually, doesn't he start dying when he doesn't mm -hmm. take it? Like, he literally starts dying <laughs> uh, because he needs this pill. So it says, do you feel constantly unfulfilled in life, work, and relationship? Do you aspire to have things that you believe you can never accomplish? Do you wish to, oh, you said yes to any of the above. NZT might be right for you. And that was the point, was that this pill that he took, and it's this little clear pill in the movie. I've, would highly recommend checking it out, gave him limitless potential, and he was superhuman when he took it. So here's the problem. Our biology, our human guys, we're humans, right? Like we're big apes, like for real, like we're just big apes. We, our biology, that has, we have prefrontal cortex, all these fun things, but our biology cannot scale with the speed Scale meaning cannot continue to grow at the same exponential rate that technology is growing at, right? Our prefrontal cortex is the most, it's the newest part of our brain. It's only been around for 10,000 years. But still, it's been around, oh, lost it. Has been around for 10,000 years though, guys. So our evolution as a bio, uh, biologically moves a lot slower than I'm sure we're noticing that technology does. So with technology, we've automated and we've maximized the 24 hours of the day. You have even people right now that call themselves biohackers. And I think we've probably all heard of something to this degree, especially being in health and wellness. Uh, if you guys have ever heard of Tim Ferriss or Dave Asprey, these are some, some uh, characters, some gentlemen who, who biohack. And so it's, it's like, how do I optimize my body almost to the point of merging with technology, right? We all have our fitness trackers, our Fitbits and all these things. But what our bodies are really screaming out for is for us to just come back to our biology, to come back to what it is to be a human, to make mistakes, to not always have the right answers. And that's why, and I think, I, this is something I saw with Terry every single day I came to class. I was like, Terry's just a human. She shows up. She's got a lot of knowledge, but she just like, she's just fun. She's playful and she makes jokes and right. And like, and it's okay to make mistakes in Terry's class. Like she doesn't, she doesn't berate you for that. Right? And, and that's one of the things that I work with and that I instill in my clients is that it's really awesome to make mistakes because then you can learn from them. And trying to, yeah, so here's the thing is don't try competing with your technology. Like I'm just going to give you that right now. Like don't try to compete with technology. Be as fast as your computer because as long as it's plugged in, you cannot keep up with your computer. So I like that graphic. I found it last night. I was very proud of it. <laughs> so I'm going to show you guys a, a short clip. <coughs> And, you know, with PowerPoints and presentations, you just always pray it's going to actually work. And there's some potential security concerns. I think we can trust this one. If you think it's a bit stressy today, it's fast, you know, enjoy this spring because it will never be this slow again. We... This one? No. Your PowerPoint had to close it down. Shut down. Did that work? No. Mm -hmm. Yay! There we go. Okay, cool. Awesome. It's only a minute 30, but I think you guys are jazzed about this. 
if you think it's a bit stressy today, it's fast, you know, enjoy the spring because it will never be this slow again. We are making our future all the time and right now. The, the level of communication that's coming in is almost too much for any of us to handle. Some people still think that success just happens. Everything's going right, we've got loads of customers, we're making loads of money, all that stuff. I just don't see that. This is leading by example, setting your compass on purpose. Between a stimulus and a response, there is a space. In that space is your power to choose your response. So let's face it, yes, it's great to have good education, it's great to have good environment, but it's not much fun if you're dead. That's innovation. That's entrepreneurship. We can tear the old business model to pieces. If you make this one conference every year, then you have a chance to start to think about some of the innovative ideas that are going to be a theme for the rest of the year. It's much bigger than I uh, anticipated. So go to Copenhagen, everyone. Um, so, how do you guys feel even just watching that? <laughs> like everything in these. Yeah, it's like, it was actually like, the word that was, it was like manic. It was like so all over the place. Um, but it was where we are today with technology and how fast things are moving. That, that was literally a conference in Copenhagen. That was, that was a real video uh, promoting this conference <coughs> called Speed of Change. And so I want you to actually just close your eyes for a moment. Sit up straight in your tall chair. Allow your breath to reach the bottom of your lungs, allowing your lungs to expand in all four directions. Allow your shoulders to grow heavy away from your ears. And allow your eyes to soften in your eye socket. notice, imagine that there's a factory floor inside your body and they're producing all these products going down this conveyor belt and everything's moving so quick. And imagine that you're the manager on the floor and you just halt production by 3%. Just slow it down by 3%. heart rate starting to go down. And you notice your lungs are fuller and wider. And slowly roll open the windows to your eyes. It's different, right? It's different. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're taught, it's like, ooh, chills. What we're taught is to do, I'm not even gonna try to pop up that video again, because it's just like, we're shown that, and we're told to be that. But I'm sure you all could probably agree that when you're in the shower, or when you're exercising, or when you're taking, you know, taking a run, or at the golf course, that that is actually when the best you comes through. And so we talked for a second about burnout and how this relates to burnout. So one of my good friends, Brooke Kelly, <coughs> says that self-care is a boundaries issue. Right? So so the idea being a boundaries issue, meaning, okay, this is where I end and this is where you begin. So making definitive decisions about how I relate to you and how I relate to myself, right? That's a boundary. 
And so self-care is the decision, it's a decision that my self-care, my needs, actually are just as important as me being to that to 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 the, the meeting that that we talked about months ago or something. It's it's just as important as that. So that way we can come to life in our fullness, right? In, 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 in the best and the greatest of us, so we can actually help others and make a difference. Have you guys ever um, taken a really long weekend, or, I mean, I know none of you guys have ever drank before, but if you, like, come to class after a long weekend, right, you're not at your fullest, right? Like, I think we can just all agree you're not at your fullest, right? And that's cool, I get it, like, that's the thing, college, woo. But, like, when you get into the workplace, whether you're working for yourself or for somebody else, you're going to want to come in your fullness. Because it's actually just going to feel good. There's going to come a day where you be like, it actually just feels better to be when I'm at my best. Right? And so what ends up happening is that external structures, like, um, like the Fitbits and like the... Um, and again, if you have a Fitbit, they're great. That's fine. But the but Fitbits and uh, what are some other external structures? Amanda? Put you on the spot. Yeah, I mean, I think I think any time that you outsource information, Amanda's like, mm. uh, any time you outsource information about yourself to somebody else, you're giving your power away, right? Like you're giving away your ability to really know that for yourself and have that discernment. So these external structures become band aids that'll just keep falling off until we start to heal that relationship that we have with self-care. So again, we'll just burn out again and again and again. So, so if we can't keep up with technology, this is where it gets, starts to get fun, guys. We can't keep up with technology, right? And we can't like keep just trying to like get faster and be better and more, 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 all these things. We need a new way to do high performance, right? It's it, like, so a lot of my clients come to me and they're burnt out and they say that, you know, they see that I'm a high performance coach and they're like, dude, I'm already in like 10th gear. How do I take it up to 12th gear? Because I'm like already, my body is completely giving out on me. And so I say, let's talk about something else. Let's talk about a different conversation about high performance. Connection equals currency. I want you guys to write that down, actually. Connection equals currency. Connection equals currency. Connection in a closed circuit of, you guys remember this electricity from like maybe sixth grade or something? Electricity, when you have a closed circuit, you get light, right? Light is there. When you have an open circuit, there's no light, right? So when you have connection with friends, with clients, right? And I loved having Spencer and Leah and, and I talking today because it really helped illuminate, even for me, more of why I do what I do and why my business and the business that I help other people run are relationship-based businesses. Because guys, we're in wellness, we're in health, right? Like you guys are not mathematicians. Mother, I love that you're a mathematician. And, she's, and my mother is the most relationship-based mathematician on the planet, I swear. So, and that's who I got it from. My mother is super gregarious and out there and, and loves loving people. And so the more that we're able to be connected to other people and connected to ourselves, I know that's a cheesy, like, I'm so connected to myself. But when you're connected to yourself and you're connected to other people, that creates currency. And currency being the, the light bulb, like, oh, wow, guys, this is working. Like, right now, like, this is working, that. But then also it creates currency. We've heard of money being currency. So it creates impact and it creates money. It's really good. Again, it doesn't matter if you're working for somebody else or you're working for yourself. But the issue a lot of times is that we go to work without the idea of connection, right? Confidence, clarity, connection. That's today, confidence, clarity, and connection. So connection, guys, the idea, does this all make sense? Like, does, ever, does anyone like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Does this all make sense? Cool, okay, cool, cool. I'm just gonna assume because I got no arms that uh, raised that that makes sense. Man, did that make sense? I think so. Cool, thanks. Redefining high performance. Guys, just for funsies, I call it Supreme Performance. So I have my online course that I call the Supreme Performance Academy. And there's a difference between performing well in our job. Guys, it's 2018. Like, we, again, like I said, we've maximized what it looks like on paper to do a really damn good job on your job, right? So, like, 
cool. Like, that's kind of a given, right, at this point, is like, do a really good job, right? But there's a difference between that and also feeling fulfilled while performing well in your job. Thanks, Barry. And, you're, and so my work at this point is helping clients renegotiate their lives. Renegotiating lives with their clients, their employees, their employers, and their loved ones. Making new agreements based on the new expectations that they want to hold in their life. Because they go, hey, listen, Bob, I, I realize that I've, I've been trying to work three jobs. And I'm realizing like I'm actually losing my relationship with my daughter because I'm trying to do 80 hours of work for you. And it may end up coming to that you actually don't end up wanting to do that job again, or maybe they even fire you or something. But the point being that you're actually coming to a place of what people would call greater alignment, right? That you're finding a career path that actually works well for you and your body, right? Wellness. So, cool. Redefining high performance. So here's the thing, guys. All humans want to be three things. We don't want to be right. We think we want to be right. Like, we think we just, like, want to have all the answers. And for someone to be like, dude, you're so smart, man. And, like, that's cool. Like, we appreciate that affirmation. But most humans, at the end of the day, want to be seen, want to be heard, and they want to be understood. And so the more that you listen to your body's natural rhythms... And so here I have circadian rhythms in humans, which I don't expect you to actually read all that, but to know that there are rhythms. And for ladies, you have a moon cycle, you have a lunar cycle, for dude, period, like they have their periods. So there are cycles that we run in as humans. And it's like, we can kind of snicker about it, but it's, right, it's like that's part of being a human. It's like we have cycles. We sleep at night, right? Or that's the idea, unless you take a bunch of Adderall or speed or caffeine or sugar or the myriad other ways to try to, push past and really beat your body into submission. And that's what a lot of people are doing these days. And that's what makes me sad because a lot of Silicon Valley, the tech industry is being built on that right now. It's part of this guy's mission. So from that place, from that place of really understanding our circadian rhythms and really listening to them, not expecting others to listen to them, but listening to them for ourselves, we can then lead a very happy, healthy, productive, fulfilling and successful life. Because when we start to listen to ourselves, we can really start to listen to others. So I work with high achieving entrepreneurs, visionaries and freelancers wanting to get more out of their lives and their bodies, their businesses, their relationships, and to turn off the constant fight or flight. And again, this is coming back to my why with my sister, right? It's like coming back to what does it look like to have a smooth nervous system where we're not on edge all the time, right? To truly connect to and build your desire, actually build your desires and dreams. I take clients' dreams and actually put them on their calendar. Like, Let's build this thing. Let's do it. Let's actually do the thing you're saying you want to do. And I use a number of systems and techniques, and that's great. But the main thing is talking about boundaries and confidence, because like we said, that leads to self-care. <coughs> okay, this is what I want to teach you guys. This is a fun thing. So uh, who mention something about it. It's okay, it'll come back to me. Undirected attention. This dude over here, his name is William James, and he's a really famous psychologist and uh, philosopher uh, from the, I think he probably was like the early 1900s, late 1800s. Actually, no, he might have been mid, mid 1800s. Anyways, our brain has two default modes. There's one actually called the default mode, which is undirected attention, which means as you can imagine, what would be the, unti the antithesis of undirected attention? Somebody. Undirected attention. What would be the opposite of that? Right. Directed. directed attention. So there is directed attention. That is when I'm deeply focused in on that thing. And I'm like working on that problem and I'm at work and I'm doing that thing. I'm figuring it out, right? That's directed attention. He talked about there being this other thing called undirected attention, which is when we're in the shower, which is when we're exercising which is when we're on the golf course. So our brain, and I'm not gonna get all sciencey on you guys because I know that can, that's what classes are for, so you guys can do that. But basically our brain gets into a lower state of consciousness, a lower brain wave frequency to where there's space in between our thoughts. So there's a stat, many of you guys. We have 60,000 
to 100,000 thoughts a day. That's one thought per second per waking hour. It's nutty. That's crazy, guys. Like, I hope all of you are like, that's kind of, wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. So, man, I just am so finicky with this thing. So, so the point, though, being that we want to spend as much time in direct attention, focusing in on something, as well as recharging that by being in undirected attention time. So how much of the day do you guys spend in your books? Maybe, maybe not that much, but hopefully you're spending some time in your books, but also spending some time out in nature, right? Like I feel like Terry would be like, nature, what up, do it. <laughs> nature. So like spending time in nature, spending time exercising, right? Spending time in the shower, spend some time in the shower. Spend, guys, I get some of my best ideas on the toilet. I'm shameless about it, it's great. I get some of my best ideas on, on the toilet. And what? Man, it's like it's true. Uh, so, so the University of Michigan did a study that they published in 2008 in the Journal of Psychological Science on the Ann Arbor, Michigan campus. And what they did is they took two groups. They took one group over here, they put them through the woods, and they just like walked around the woods, and they were just enjoying the woods, and they were there for maybe an hour or something. They took another group, the other one, through bustling uh, downtown, through the city. And there was like, all these things to look at, and, and there's just there's so many things, and there's so many people talking, and there's all the birds, and there's all the things. And then they gave them a test. Which one do you think had better scores? Nature one. Yeah. Did anybody say the city one? I think the city one. Okay, good. You guys paying attention. So yeah, the woods guys, they had 20% <coughs> better scores. 20%. That's actually huge. That's humongous. And that was because they were recharging their directed attention by being in undirected attention. Does that make sense, guys? It's kind of like the teeter-totter effect that as you're boosting one, you're letting the other one recharge, and as you're using one, you're boosting. Actually, I didn't say that very clearly. You, you guys all got it, it's cool. <laughs> so here's the takeaway, guys. Close your eyes every hour for like two breaths. So we're, go ahead right now. Close your eyes, and just take two really deep, full breaths. Stay really close to yourself. Even with your eyes closed, I'm just going to explain the brain uses a whole lot of power simply to see the world, simply to take in the world. So you can go ahead and open up your eyes. So just simply closing your eyes and then bring it back up to the real world again. You have, actually, even with your eyes closed, it's still the real world, but having your eyes closed gives your moment, your brain a moment of undirected attention. Just a moment, right? Because I think sometimes when we talk about yoga practices and we talk about journaling, we talk about meditating and going out to the woods for an hour, some days that's just impossible, right guys? Like I think we can all, like we're, in all, we're all in health promotion, we can all like agree. It's like, yeah, I don't do like all the yoga stuff all the time. I don't really meditate all that much. Cause like I have classes and I have like all this other crap I gotta do and I'm in this organization and I'm like at a, conference like this, right? We don't all have the time to always be in nature or spending an hour and a half in a yoga class, right? So our energy, our physical vitality, I'm not getting all California on you. I could get real California if you want, like on the real woo-woo level. But our physical energy, our vitality, has it's a give and take mechanism, right? It's a giving and a receiving mechanism. And so when we don't have anything left to give, what do you think happens? There's only, two, there's only two modes. So if we don't have anything left to give, what starts happening? Yeah, we start taking. So everyone's like, what, how does that work? We start being kind of rude. We start like, having kind of a snippy response in that email. Or we start kind of resenting that person. And then in underlying little ways, it kind of comes out, right? Because we've given so much that eventually we just have to start taking whether we're conscious of it or not. So like, let's just be conscious of it. Like, let's actually be aware that it's like, all right, cool, so as I give, I'm also going to receive. And our and that's, again, this is all our nervous system is looking for, is looking for ways to recharge, right? So self-care has got to be a daily practice. It's gotta be a lifestyle, is what I really wanted to impart uh, to you guys, to come to connection with ourselves and be in this constant flow of give and receive. So. Uh, we're getting we're getting close to the end here. So your energy, again, last thing is, it's actually, it's not like a battery so much. 
that needs to get recharged, your, your energy, and I got this from my mentor, Siobhan Moran, again, she talks a lot about it being more like a bank account that actually accrues interest. And if you guys notice this, I want you guys to think about if you've ever done like a 30-day thing where you worked out for 30 days, and you just kept working out, and you kept working out, and you kept working out. Did you notice that your energy and your vitality started to just get exponentially better the more and more that you kept doing those days over and over and over again? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Or like when you eat really well for 30 days or 60 days, your energy just starts to get exponentially better, right? You don't start back at square one the next day, right? It actually just starts to get better. It starts to get better. It starts to get better. So it's not so much like a battery that every day you got to recharge it. It's like, no, if you just do those little things that Terry teaches in her classes, that um, Kelly teaches in her classes, that that starts to slowly begin to build this bank of energy that you're going to have. So I'm bringing on back now. So where am I now? <laughs> uh, I started the story, talked about all the Adderall, and then I left you hanging there with that. So after college, I worked for a tech company in San Diego. I worked 60, 70 hour work weeks and, um, and I loved it because I was on Adderall. I'm all this stuff, I'm learning so much stuff, this is so great, I have all the energy in the world. And then uh, I completely burnt out because of the Adderall. And this is like at like 24, not that far ahead of you guys, 24 um, because of the Adderall because it was burning out my adrenal glands. I was burning out, um, yeah, I was just my whole body and, and my mental space was just completely burnt out uh, and poor work habits. So I got off Adderall, my story at the very beginning, and during my 90 days of withdrawal, it takes about 90 days for the brain to get pretty much back to normal, uh, I began to rebuild my brain chemistry in my life, and it was the hardest 90 days of my life. I mean, legitimately, it was was really damn hard and my wife was such a rock in that time. She was, man, she, you're so good to love me. Um, I'm sharing this with you because I want you to have it all, guys. I, want, I really like, I'm actually getting a little emotional thing about it. And so what I started doing, I began researching the latest in neuroscience along with growing a strong yoga practice, right? And again, I'm not talking about an hour and a half, I'm talking about, I did 15 minutes every day. And to this day, I try to get in about 15 minutes or I do like a high intensity workout or something, but something to just get me going. And I do something to feed my brain. I read, I found mentors and coaches that showed me how to build a business. And I've read hundreds and hundreds of books and coached dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of clients on relationships, high performance, and now business coaching as well. And now I have my online academy called The Spring Performance Academy. And this is obviously me having my hot form of business. <laughs> me uh, celebrating Amanda on our wedding day. Um, I get to come to Wisconsin and hang out with my friend. This is my dog Sophie. Which yeah, you'll get to this. She's there too. Uh, she's a spit. She's a spaniel pit bull. Uh, and my parents, which obviously are here as well right now. And so I get to do this. I get to travel to Wisconsin whenever I want. I get to take my guys. I do my business. I can do it on the. This is, I, get to, I get to wake up next to this girl, and I get to uh, both of these girls, and we get to just like we hang out at the coolest coffee shops. Like we just get to like bum around and see this. And again, like it's all it's not all glitz and glam. I'm not going to give you guys the whole Facebook like oh check out my life. But <laughs> I do have a great life. But you know, of course, there's downs to it. I just explained a whole bunch of them to you. But but like on the whole, this is my life, and I just see yeah, I couldn't be more happy with that. So the thing. The thing that I really want to instill in you guys as the high performance guy, as you're leaving college, or as you're exploring, like, what do I want to do in this wellness field, and building a career working for yourself or someone else is that everything is negotiable. Everything is negotiable. Again, this is coming from the entrepreneur. Everything is negotiable. Where you live, who you love, uh, what you do, who you work for, who you work with, everything is negotiable. Many of us wait for permission, right? I was the Mr. Nice Guy. I was like, somebody please just tell me how to do it right, because if I do it right, then I'll have a smooth, happy sailing life, right? Like that was that was the belief for so long that, yeah, we, we just wait around for permission without ever actually just going after what we want or even fully knowing what we really want. Guys, 
if you get anything from this talk today, I hope that you start to really consider what do I really, really want? What do I want? Not just in this wellness career, but like in all of it. Do I want, like, do I want a family? Do I want to have a house or do I just want to like actually backpack and travel all over the world? Some of our best friends are nomads. Like I have a friend that just went down to Thailand and like, you know, it's like, and they do that and that's, it's awesome. And I'm so happy for them. It's not my, it's not my gig. I want to have a home with this lady. Like I want to build a family. I want to have kids. I want to do all that. Also because I'm a Wisconsin boy and I think that's Wisconsin boys like that. <laughs> but yeah, I just, when you do that, this is my last slide here guys, is that I want to encourage you to build a life around you. Now listen, everyone's like, that's selfish. But here's the thing is, when you build a life around you, you can truly be of service to others. Otherwise, your body will be alive a while, but your soul will be slowly dying at 22. I truly mean that. I think anybody who's, who's uh, older than in their 20s could also agree with that. So feed your soul, and you feed the world. So, thank you so much, guys. It's such a questions you guys have. We can do some movement stuff too if that feels fun, but do you guys have any questions? I'd love to hear because I know that um, I just shared a lot, right? And so I want to know what are what are some of your guys' like thoughts about like any of you that are considering entrepreneurship or are or are just like, man, this wellness degree, I'm stoked about it, but I'm still kind of confused on where to go with it. Give it to me. What you got? What you got? Thank you, Isaiah. Where do you look for help when it comes to entrepreneurship? Like, how did you find your mentors? How did you find mm -hmm. people that really helped you? That's such a good question. I found groups that I was really attracted to, and then I looked who was leading those groups and talked to those people. Would you agree, Amanda? That's how, oh, that's how I do it. Okay. But what do you do? Amanda's also a really successful entrepreneur in her own right. I was just saying about, I'm just saying about how to be a leader. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so, so in yoga, the, in the yoga industry, there's this woman that I work with. Her name's Elena Brower. She's world-renowned if you're in the yoga industry. She teaches on a website called Yoga Glow and all these cool things. And so she was like the epitome of yoga. And I was like, I'm going to you. And I just, I felt super in my body. I felt super, like, with it when I was, when I was, doing her stuff, right? When I was talking to her, when I was taking her classes. So when I felt like the most me, that was the person that I wanted to talk to. And then I wanted to be like, please mentor me, whatever that looks like. So, and guys, I'm not gonna lie, I paid a coach, um, I paid a coach $10,000 to work with him for three months at one point. So I'm not saying it's it's always cheap, but, but I will say that there are also lots of free resources out there. So if you are inspired to do entrepreneurship, Read like crazy about it. Find out every resource that you can um, about it. And, and yeah, find those mentors uh, that are in the groups that really inspire you. Yeah, that's a great question. I really like that. Yeah. yeah, cool. What else? It doesn't even have to be about entrepreneurship. It could be about relationships. Amanda and I have a business called Relational Intelligence. We could talk about relationships, too. What else you guys got? Yeah. So, obviously, you're from Wisconsin, and you live in California now. So, did you always know that you kind of wanted to go far away? Or, like, how did you get past that barrier of, like, everything I know is here, but I might want to move somewhere else. I might want to go somewhere else. That's such a great question. Wow. <laughs> you guys ask it. Yeah, I keep saying it, but, like, these are legitimately really good questions. Uh, Guys, did you, do you guys all kind of feel that way? Like it's like a little like, oh, I can't leave Wisconsin. It feels so safe and like cozy here. Yeah, I I love my family to death, and they're the only reason that I would be in Wisconsin. I love them so so much. I'm so close to them. We talk every week, maybe every two weeks sometimes now, but we talk a lot. Um, what inspired me to leave was was my career. Was, was really figuring out what I wanted to do. And I saw that, that I couldn't do it to the degree or to the level that I wanted to, because I was like, I'm doing this big. This is gonna be a big deal. I'm really excited about this. And I knew that Wisconsin, for me, wasn't the place to do it. Um, especially, I think now, like, there's yoga everywhere. You can go to Madison and there's like 
whole much yoga. But like when I first, when I got, I spent, wow, this is what it's like to like, oh, I feel like, I literally feel like an old person right now. I'm saying this like, oh, when I was a kid, because I know, I remember Terry used to tell stories, she'd be like, well, when we were kids. Um, but like, yeah, uh, yeah, when I started, there wasn't yoga. There wasn't a whole lot of yoga in Wisconsin. So I was like, I'm going to Los Angeles, man. I'm going to figure this out. So I ended up going to, so my trajectory, I went to Vancouver, Canada. I did that, my yoga online internship. And then I came home for like two months or something. And then I went out to Los Angeles to get more training. So we were talking about certifications. I wanted, I decided I wanted more certifications. So I did go out to Los Angeles, studied with a teacher out there for yoga, and I got hired by a company to go move to San Diego and work for them. So again, I emailed them, just said I freaking love your company, I'd love to work for you. And they're like, great, can you be here on Friday? I'm like, great, let's do it. It was awesome, so yeah. So does that answer, I don't even know if that like fully answers what you're, but, but it doesn't, no. Well, how, I want to appease your question um, yeah, no, I said career though, right? Career, like I was really inspired about what what I could do outside of Wisconsin. And I know that someday I'll spend more time here. Amanda may not feel that way, but I, I really want to spend more time. Amanda's from Texas, so we're gonna be actually moving to Texas at the end of the year, probably around October or something. So we kind of like triangulated the states and made it to San Diego. Um, but yeah, so I would say it was that I felt like there was more opportunity for me outside of, outside of Wisconsin. Hey Ben, can I interject on that piece real quick? Please, yeah, yeah. So, being from Wisconsin, going to California. Yes. I went from California to Yes. <laughs> I love that. So, it, it really comes down to, I mean, I grew up in San Francisco right now. Yeah. I've been there many times, San Diego many times. Um, I still have family in Santa Barbara, San Francisco. Uh, the big thing is looking at your career, looking at your life calling, <coughs> is don't limit yourself to a specific area. Yes. Okay, that's so that's that. the big part of it. it is, yeah. Yes, career is important. Making money is important. Money doesn't create happiness, but money can create opportunity. Yeah. So there's a little bit of difference there. Um, but if you try to restrict yourself to go, well, I grew up in Milwaukee. <clears throat> I went to school at point and I got to go back to Milwaukee. You may not find your calling. Okay? Yeah. You're restricting yourself. So look around to where there's great opportunity, possibilities to learn, possibilities to grow as an individual. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't go out and say move to Texas, California, Oregon, East Coast, somewhere, wherever it might be, and then you get your experience and then come back yes. and find that opportunity back to where your homeland is. Okay, that, that's a big, big piece of it. So don't restrict yourself to think, well, I have to be here, yes. especially if you want to grow as an individual. Okay, because there's so many people to learn from, and there's so many opportunities out there because somebody is always doing it better. Yeah. So don't think that you're like, I'm best, I'm sticking here. Because yeah. <laughs> it's not true. There's always somebody better, and you can always learn more. So don't restrict yourself to just Wisconsin. But I went from California, I've lived in nine different states, wow. okay? Uh, I have four kids, they've been born in four different states. <laughs> I told my wife, no more moving, no yeah. more kids. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we just ended up in Wisconsin, it, there was a great opportunity uh, you know, with the National Wellness Institute. We're in a great community in the, in the Point area. Uh, you know, the cost of living is much cheaper. Uh, but you know, I, I get an opportunity to get up, I travel the country. And so it gives me an opportunity to go out and, and meet people. Yeah. But don't restrict yourself. Don't in anything in life. Don't restrict yourself yeah. because you will never be the full potential of who you could be. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. So, That's so good. No, I so appreciate Matt saying that because absolutely. And I, guys, I would say if you're in Wisconsin, the National Wellness Institute is dope. Like that is such a <laughs> cool opportunity to be able to work with, on a on a global national scale doing work in wellness in Wisconsin. Kimberly Clark, same thing, super cool opportunities. So like, you guys definitely have opportunity if you choose to stay in Wisconsin. And I like what Matt said, that it's letting whatever your motivation that may it be to be either in the state, to be out of state, doesn't really matter. But I think in the Midwest, we do have this loyalty to our, to our hometown and to our families and all these things that sometimes it is, it's a little hard to like 
pull away from, but I'd say that this is the time to do it. And to Matt's point, it's like, you can always go back. And in fact, that's what we're doing with Amanda. It's like, we're going back to where Amanda lives uh, to live our lives and to grow a family and to buy a home. It's like over a million dollars to buy like a simple home in San Diego. We're not doing that yet. So, so, so we're going to Texas, which we're super excited about. Um, so you can always go back to, so you can always come back to Wisconsin, but guys, don't wait until you're like, oh, I'll do that when I'm 35. Like, I'm sorry, you probably won't. There's something called inertia. And <laughs> you kind of just like stay in that same group once you get it going. So, that's the thing I'd say. Yes, Amanda. I would admit this in the Facebook, like Facebook's real, humans, you know, they're real on Facebook. You can like always form a relationship that way too. Uh, and, and what I do now in my business, I talked about connection calls that I do with people. I literally reach out to people and say, hey, you seem super cool. Would love to learn more about you and see where the synergies lie and how we can support each other. That's it. And usually it turns into a phone call. It's not like I could call Matt. And we could literally just have a great 30-minute conversation about how we can support each other right now in our businesses. And everybody wins. Everybody gets a new best friend. It's awesome. <laughs> and uh, I think that's a really cool way to get your career started. So, Cool. Thank you so much, guys. Such a pleasure. And I think my time's up. So thanks. <laughs>